Good afternoon. I'd like to call to order the uh, May 19th meeting of the Merced County Association of Governments. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, we do not have a quorum. Well, I guess we'll do roll call now. Oh, we, we have a we quorum. Now. Yay. <laughs> Welcome. You were waiting. Okay, and I'll go ahead and call the roll. Director Aguilar. Not present. Director Kale. Director Espinoza. Uh, Director Faria. Uh, Council Member Deborah Lewis attending in his stead. Awesome. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Director Hogue. Here. Director McDaniel. Present. Director Nagy. Present. Director Pedroso, Director Serrato, Director Silvera, present. Director Pereira, present. Okay, we do have a quorum. Did you get all that, Joy? Yes, thank you. <laughs> all right, um, at this time, we'll move to uh, item B, which is our invocation. Is there anybody in the audience that would like to provide an invocation? Oh, perfect. Please bow your head if you're so inclined. Heavenly Father, Father God, we just love you and praise you. We thank you for the opportunity to meet in, in this place and to honor you before with our words and deeds. And Father, just pray for staff who's diligently worked on the items before this board. We pray for this board to have uh, the clear thought and, and uh, ability to make uh, good decisions on behalf of the residents of Merced County. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And uh, Emily, would you like to lead us in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Eric, and thank you, Emily. Next item is approval of the agenda. Were there any additions or changes? No, Mr. Chair. Okay, Mr. Vera, motion to approve. Is there a second? I'll second that. All right. So, uh, been moved by Director Silvera, uh, seconded by Director McDaniel. Um, would you please call the roll? Director Kale. Director Espinoza. Director Lewis? Yes. Director Hogue? Yes. Director McDaniel? McDaniel, aye. Director Nagy? Aye. Director Silvera? Aye. Chair Pereira? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. All right, thank you. And then has uh, Director Kale joined the meeting? No, okay. We'll move now to uh, public comment. If anybody would like to make public comment, please come up to the podium. Seeing that, we'll close public comment. Move to item four. Uh, we have our illustrious uh, Caltrans director with us. Dennis, would you like to? Yeah, that's a nice seat. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and of course, I always bring my partner in crime here, uh, Marlon Richardsburg. He always follows up with uh, other action items and, and updates. So if you don't mind and allow us to give our full update um, between me and Marlon, we would appreciate that. All right, so good afternoon, Mr. Chair um, and members of the board. Of course, it's good to see you, Executive Director Stacey Guzman. And of course, nice uh, to see Scott um, doing better today. So um, glad to see everyone. Uh, I do want to just start with some other acknowledgments. Uh, first, I uh, had the opportunity to uh, participate in Marlin as well, the San Joaquin Valley uh, Policy Conference uh, last week, uh, not too long ago. And it was a great conference. It was uh, uh, hosted by President Cog. Uh, they did a great job. They had a lot of great topics. Of course, I got to see a, a few of you folks out there as well. 
I actually had the time to spend with um, uh, Director uh, Kale and got to know him a little bit better. So that was really nice uh, to spend time with him and even your staff, Stacy. Uh, great team that you have. Uh, but, uh, really enjoyed uh, that uh, conference, and it just reminds me that I need to bring my whole executive team next time. Uh, so whoever's hosting it next time, I, I'm going to want to make sure uh, that my team comes in and, and learn from a lot of those uh, workshops and presentations that uh, you'll uh, have to speak about here in the Central Valley. Uh, the other acknowledgement I wanted to make is uh, had the opportunity, again, I've seen uh, Chair Farah for the last three days and probably the most I've seen in a year and a half, uh, especially with COVID, but uh, got to uh, uh, celebrate the ribbon cutting uh, for the pedestrian hawk system in the town of Hillmar. That was a great event. Uh, I want to thank Assemblyman Adam Gray for actually attending in person. Uh, he was one of our speakers. Uh, Chair was one of our speakers as well. I really appreciate the partnership we have with the uh, Hillmar Unified School District. Uh, it, I think it turned out really great with, with that um, uh, hawk system out in place now. And we really look forward to completing the rest of the uh, safety improvements we have along State Route 165 and Hillmar. Uh, just being out there, uh, you, you can see the number of traffic that uh, gets right through those schools. And it's an average of 10,000 vehicles a day uh, that go through there. That's that's quite a bit. Uh, so that's the, the other announcement I wanted to make. Uh, I also uh, just wanted to um, uh, let you know, and you've probably all seen it uh, end of uh, April, uh, Caltrans uh, held their annual Caltrans Workers Memorial uh, honoring the 189 uh, 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 employees that we've lost during the job. Uh, it's always a great reminder for all of us uh, just to acknowledge all those that work along our highways and put themselves at risk uh, with the traveling public. And it was a great event that was held at the Sacramento Capitol. I got to go and attend in person as well. Uh, and within, again, it's a somber but great event that, uh, again, keep us um, minded of, of the traveling public and our construction going on out there. Uh, unfortunately, we did lose this last year, uh, three contractors on work zone accidents. Um, uh, we didn't lose any of our Caltrans employees, but uh, it doesn't matter, right? These are our folks. These are our family members. These are uh, fathers and mothers of, of our children, right? And we want to make sure we acknowledge those that work along with us uh, out there on the highway. So I just want to ask that uh, people, uh, uh, please uh, keep out uh, looking out for our highway workers out there. Uh, slow for the code zone. Uh, please pull over when, when you see us uh, working out there. Uh, speaking of uh, safety work zone, I, I also wanted to thank, um, or actually thank the communities out there, Merced and Atwater, uh, having to deal with our construction work that's going on out there right now with our full rehab uh, construction going on and our staging. Uh, that we've um, been doing for the last, uh, uh, seems like a long time now, but uh, we're really moving forward and trying to get uh, that work done. Uh, so uh, appreciate the patience that uh, the communities have, uh, the traveling public have that going up and down uh, Merced and, and Atwater. Uh, I also uh, want to uh, mention that uh, we have uh, other updates and we always send all of you uh, update all the activity that's going on in Merced County, uh, whether it's maintenance, safety, our capital projects. Um, I had a little minor error on that and I, I don't know, Stacey, you had a chance to update you know, your membership, but it does talk about all those continuing activities uh, that we're doing all for you. Uh, I just, uh, I know there's other board actions. I, we are fully committed in following through with those board actions. and. I was going to ask Marlon, as a matter of fact, to give some updates on some of those actions that you may be interested in, in hearing about. Um, let's see, did I cover everything I wanted for now? I think I did. And so I'd like to do, that's okay, Mr. Chair, so I ask uh, my deputy uh, to come on up and uh, give a little bit more uh, uh, updates on some of the action items and some of the other uh, planning efforts that's going on in Caltrans. So before, before you step down, if you don't mind. Yes. Um, I, I just want to thank you again. Um, I, you know, um, Caltrans um, is different today than it was, whatever, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, right? I, to me, anyways, more responsive um, and, and, you know, in safety issues, more proactive, you know, and uh, uh, 
anyways, I just really appreciate it. You know, I, I just wanted to thank you. Um, you know, I, I think uh, sometimes, you know, local people feel like people, you know, because people consider you part of the Sacramento group, right? And, 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 you know, so local folks don't necessarily think that those folks care about how our lives are affected daily. And, and uh, anyway, so you're, you're just a fresh uh, breath of fresh air and letting us know that things that affect us are important to you and appreciate your responsiveness. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for those comments. That, that means a lot. I, I do want to, to let you all know that uh, Caltrans is a different um, organization now, and we're really trying to focus on uh, meaningful uh, public engagement uh, with the communities that we serve, and that's really how we want to look at this. So what's important to you is important to us, and especially here locally. I may have eight counties, but eight, every eight counties is, is like my backyard, and I'm responsible, and I want to make sure that we do our part. So thank you for your comment. Thanks, Dennis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you to the board. Thank you, Madam Director. Um, just want to provide a couple of additional remarks on the Caltrans side. Um, a couple of announcements, I should say. Um, one regarding funding, we are tracking. Um, we recently are aware, and some of you may have already seen, um, the Governor Newsom has released his fiscal year 22-23 May budget revision. And this includes a proposal to accelerate $600 million of general funds into the current uh, fiscal year 21-22 for valuable infrastructure improvements that were originally proposed in next year's budget. Um, this immediate investment is intended to take advantage of greater project revenue in the general fund for the current year, but it must be agreed upon by a legislature uh, before the funding becomes available. And this also includes a proposal to provide $400 to each eligible registered vehicle owner, and that's for up to two vehicles per household. Um, also, nearly $750 million will be available for proposed transit funding for local transportation operators uh, to provide free public transport for three months. And also a proposal to pause the diesel sales tax for one year to assist commercial operators. Um, this is estimated as a $439 million relief. Um, this is something that we're tracking. Of course, this has to be approved by state legislature. So as, as we receive more information, we'll share that with the board accordingly. Um, I also wanna mention our um, California Transportation Commission has announced their call for the 2023 active transportation projects that include cycle six of the active transportation program. This is just a reminder that the applications are due to be submitted to CTC by June 15th of this year, which is next month. So um, just a reminder. And also a couple other announcements, uh, one being for our Sustainable Transportation Planning Grant application guide. This is now have been posted on our Caltrans website. Uh, we are encouraging um, general public and partners to review the grant application guide. This will be um, available for comment until May 25th, which I believe is next week. So. Um, if you have any, um, if you'd like to view it, it's on our Caltrans website. If you need the link, I can share that with the board. And um, the comments will be directed to regional.planning.grants at dot.ca.gov. You can also send comments to me and I'll, I'll share them with the court. Um, our state bicycle pedestrian plan progress report. This is a, of course, a report for our 2017 statewide bike ped plan. Um, District 10 has recently completed our active transportation plan, but this is regarding the statewide plan. There is a webinar tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. If you're interested, I can send the link to you all. Um, it's basically um, hearing about the scope of the, the progress report, how to share um, your agency successes in the update of the statewide bike ped plan, and also successes from around the state regarding bicycle pedestrian infrastructure. So I encourage you to attend the webinar if you're interested. And again, I'll happy to share information with you regarding that. Lastly, I do want to mention um, because our current campaign is let's change this to that. That's our current public education campaign. 
And this is regarding stormwater pollution and ways to prevent contamination in California's waterways. I'm gonna name the six top pollutants, trash and litter, sediments, nutrients, bacteria, metals, and pesticides. So we're encouraging all folks across the state to be water wise and, and protect our waterways throughout the state. Um, this is something that will help the environment. Um, you'll see that on some of our changeable message signs across the state. Um, that's all I, I really want to share on that. That does conclude my comments. Oh, actually, I, I do have a couple other things I want to mention regarding the action items that were mentioned previously at um, the board. Um, Mr. Chair, I, I do understand our maintenance team had made some improvements to the northbound shoulder on Route 59 between Merced and Snelling. However, um, if there's an additional work that you'd like to see done, please let us know. Um, we're happy to you know, work with you on getting our maintenance team to, to take a look. Um, regarding the Legrand sign, which was mentioned previously as well, um, we are currently working with our partners in District 6, Fresno and, and Madera County to see if we can get that expedited as soon as possible. Um, I don't have a particular status update, but I'm hoping that we'll be able to get that sign replacement very soon. Um, so hopefully we'll have an update next round. And let's see, um, there was a request regarding Livingston uh, Main Street um, lighting. I think um, Ms. Chair, or excuse me, Madam Director, um, we would like to further discuss that with you on possibilities for improving that, that lighting. Um, that concludes my comments. If there's any questions, thoughts, I'm happy to hear it. And thanks for the time. I, I do. I have a question. Hi. Good afternoon. Um, we have a sidewalk project on uh, in Dos Palos on Valeria. And I think it's tied to you because it comes off of Highway 33, but it's been going on for a really long time. And it's just a sidewalk that doesn't have a sidewalk, a street that doesn't have a sidewalk, but it goes, it ties to two elementary schools. So the kids have to cross the street and then go down the street and then cross the street because there's no sidewalk on that one side of the street. Um, but it's taking forever for us. And, and it seems like we're, we're putting in an application and then we're waiting for the application. Can you just give me an update next time on how soon that maybe could be pushed through? Because it seems like it's been like four years now. It's really been a long time. <laughs> so um, it would be nice to have the sidewalk done before school starts next year, um, just so that the kids will have a safe place to walk. But it's the Valeria Street, um, and then I think it goes to 33. Okay. We'll check on Thank that. You. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Sure. A couple of things, and I don't know if this is for, for Marlon or for Dennis. Just an update on 59, Highway 59 and the Mariposa Creek Bridge. I know that, I know we've talked about it before. I think there's a plan in place that was, you know, Caltrans plan was like, years and I feel like at least a year or two has passed so just an, an update on I don't need it right now but maybe for next month just an update as where we're, where we're at I know I've seen out there a few times where there's been some surveying work going on I've seen some some road work going on there but you know I know right now we're in a drought might be a good time to take care of it before we catch that rain again and then the other thing was just a comment is I'm still waiting I haven't got a request for your letter of support to be the director of Caltrans. I don't know if they filled that position yet already. No, they haven't, but I uh, do appreciate again, uh, uh, the recommendation. Uh, we're hoping to get a, uh, have an announcement come out from either the governor's office or uh, Secretary uh, Tokso Mishakin on who our new director is going to be. Uh, I'm anticipating, at least uh, from what I've heard, uh, anytime this month, we will have an announcement. Uh, if you ask me who I think it is, I I am just as uh, you probably know, and I probably don't. So just as put it that way, I'm looking forward to finding out who who my new boss is, uh, if it's not myself. Uh, <laughs> that full recommendation. Thank you, sir. Darren. 
Yeah, thank you, Dennis. I just want to thank you for taking the time yesterday for the sidebar meeting. I know the CTC reception and us honoring Leanne there in Fresno, but I appreciate both you and Leanne Eager for taking that time. And I think I think it was a very, very good discussion and would appreciate your follow through on that, anything you can do to help. So thank you. And absolutely, uh, Director McDaniel. Uh, it was a, a very good meeting and uh, I'm very uh, hopeful and, and positive and uh, definitely will follow through. You know that old saying that no good deed goes uh, like unpunished, like you think it is. But uh, so uh, so the post on the ribbon cutting in Hillmar, I uh, had a, a constituent from Gustine reach out to me, and I haven't had a chance to talk uh, to the mayor about it. But so there, there's there's this lady suggested three sites that need a hot system in Gustine on Highway 14033. Okay. And so I'll I just want to give you a heads up that uh, we'll we'll talk about it. And, and uh, maybe hopefully uh, get some moving there. Um, and then to your comment about the North 59. So what, what's happened is um, over, I bet you Highway 59 has been paved twice in certain areas with really, you know, uh, a marginal amount of uh, shoulder material added, right? So almost everywhere, there's at least a three or five inch divot. So it, it really needs somebody to, to go through and mark it all, I, I mean, I know I keep bringing this up, and uh, but but I, you know, there's been a lot of accidents, especially um, would be uh, just um, west of the Snelling Road intersection. You know, there's some S turns in there, and there's been you know quite a few rollover accidents in there, and you know, that you know that would be one area that. All right, thanks again. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. And if I could just uh, offer, if you have a staff member that you would like uh, our maintenance folks to be out there with so we can really identify it together, I want to make sure we address it properly and address the right locations. Because uh, I know my team is willing to go out there and do the right thing. We probably just need some guidance and direction from exactly where that needs to be fixed. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I don't have a staff, so that's me. Okay. But I didn't want to have to ride with them. And you know, okay. Yeah. If you're willing to spare the time, I'll, I'll make the arrangement. Yeah. Give uh, forward on, you know, to your Merced office, I guess, uh, you know, my name and number and just have them let me know or, you know, we can coordinate a date and go. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Chair, we do have a hand raised oh. from the public. Okay. Um, uh, sure. Go ahead and see what we got. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rio Gonzalez, and I am a community leader here in the County of Merced. I just wanted to uplift a crucial issue that we've been hearing from the residents that we work with. Um, residents have let us know that they really would like to see a traffic light stop at the intersection of Gerard Avenue and Highway 59 due to cars going to the Farmdale Elementary School um, because of you know, parents dropping their children off. That street gets really, really busy and really backed up um, because it's only a one lane, uh, only one lane each way. So they would really like to see a traffic light to help facilitate with the traffic. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right, thanks again. We'll move on to item five. We have uh, Shane Smith who's gonna give us the advisory committee report. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good see everybody. What do you think? Got rid of the 80s hair bands? <laughs> <laughs> My wife says, now you look like a 90s boy band, so I don't know if we're going the right direction. There you go. <laughs> I'm chairing, as you know, the Citizens Advisory Committee to you, you all. We are last meeting on May 6th. And you've seen the highlights at item five in your packet. And, you know, you pretty much gave our stamp of approval to the good work that the staff is doing. Uh, I want to pull out three key observations that I took away from the discussion for you guys to consider. Uh, number one, in I think on your agenda today, you've got to take a look at the regional transportation plan slash sustainable community strategy. And you had an advisory committee that recommended it's called option three, which is sort of the most aggressive investments in interconnectivity and infill to try to preserve agricultural land, 
make walkable neighborhoods, and a lot of a lot of values that we've heard a lot of residents support. Um, proud to tell you that the the committee also unanimously supports the recommendation of option three, and it'd be our our view that uh, this this body should also support option three. Second thing, we we had a visit from Mr. Eric Zetz, director of Merced County Regional Waste Authority, who's sitting behind me. Um, it's interesting for a transportation committee, the, the folks like to talk about trash a lot. Uh, so we were excited to, to hear from Mr. Zetz, um, learned a lot about his operation. What I want to report to you all is there was kind of consensus support in the room. We're going to the third green can. Uh, a lot of interest in organic recycling. I know from my experience, I lived in San Francisco for about a year. This is when I had only a small child and no cats. But when you take all the food waste and you put it in the green can, you walk out to the landfill with like a half-filled garbage bag every week. It's amazing. So uh, support for seeing that implemented in Merced County. Everybody understands, though, it's a big lift. And you guys have your work cut out for, for us. I mean, we're hoping the technology is there to make it cost-effective for a small rural county like Merced County. But just know that people want to see the green can. And then lastly, we had a discussion about maybe not be an increasing problem, but some of our homeless residents tunneling under the embankments of bike paths and bike bridges. And I think it goes without saying, I'm not an engineer, but not safe for the, the person doing the digging or the person riding the bike over the top. The observation I took away was that people kind of feel like this isn't a maintenance problem, it's a public safety problem. And for you guys, you think about budgeting and how to tackle it, you know, right? These things happen, we want to have the, the money to get fixed. Maybe there's a way we can monitor so it doesn't happen in the first place or we catch it before somebody gets hurt. So those are my three key observations. I'll pause there. Any questions for me before I depart? All right, we're thorough, no question. Thank you very much, guys. You're welcome. See you Thank soon, you. okay? Thank you. I can say, Shane, I'm waiting for you to grow up long in the back. <laughs> <laughs> I find my junior high school pictures here. <laughs> all right, we'll move to item six, which is our uh, informational items. Uh, they were all in your packet. Did anybody have any uh, questions on any of them? I, I would just, Mr. Chair, like to draw uh, the board's attention to um, the Central California Travel Survey. It's on page 32. Um, just to, I, I don't need to talk much about it, but just want to make sure that. Um, the board is aware that MCAG is participating on behalf of, of the Mercer County region with our Valley partners on collecting some travel behavior uh, information through a survey. So if you get a phone call or you receive a postcard that's soliciting your, your uh, input as a resident of the county, that that is a legit request and it is something that MCAG is partnering with our Valley partners to do. Well, I'll throw it on the gauntlet. I filled out my survey, so um, hopefully everyone gets this opportunity to do that. Okay, any other um, questions or comments on our informational items? Okay, seeing none, we'll move to our consent calendar. Pleasure of the board. Mr. Chair, I'll move to approve. Been second. Been moved by Director McDaniel, seconded by Director Nagy. Uh, see no further comments, I'll vote for public comment. Are there any public comments on this, these items? No public comment, none in the house. Okay, please call the roll. Director Lewis? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Director Hogue? Yes. Director McDaniel? Aye. Director Nagy? Aye. Director Silvera? Aye. Chair Pereira? Aye. Thank you. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you for that, Joy. We'll move on to item 10, which is uh, Mercy County Association of Governments. Our two action items. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, just item eight, the oh. Transit Joint Powers Authority um, Action 8A, adopt the final. 2022-23 operating and capital budget. Now. Thank you. Good afternoon, directors. Uh, before you is uh, TJPA's uh, final budget for fiscal year 22-23 for adoption. As we gave a presentation last month, I'll keep it short and brief. 
we are planning on including uh, utilizing three sources of COVID relief funding for fiscal year 22 23. Uh, we're anticipating our operational budget to increase by 5%, which is $732,000. The main factor for the increase is the operational and maintenance cost contract annual increase and fuel. We're also anticipating, or well, not anticipating, we are including a cost of living adjustment for staff, which is COLA. We're also uh, we're maintaining the same staff level, no new positions this year in the budget. Our priorities for 22-23 are um, route network improvement, ongoing uh, replacement of aging fleet, uh, facility and bus stop maintenance, along with capital projects to ad address long-lasting um, impacts of COVID and future uh, electrification of the fleet. If you turn to your packet on page 150, it's our, our draft operating revenue budget. As you can see, it's increased by 5%, which is $732,000. Um, the biggest increase is we're, we're increasing our, our fare box revenue along with uh, Measure B funds. And uh, we're also utilizing the LC Top, which is Low Carbon Transit Operating Program, which is from July to September will be free rides for those who don't qualify for either Measure B or Houston Merced students or Merced College. Any questions on the revenues? Any questions? On the expenditures, the biggest increase, as I mentioned, is the operation and maintenance. Uh, but we do do see we do see a, a decrease in professional services of six percent, which equates to one hundred sixty seven hundred sixty seven thousand uh, dollars. As I mentioned, our total operational expense increased by five percent. Um, on the capital side, we are looking at completing the operation at the staffs. No, we are looking at completing the administrative building in sometime in September and October of twenty two twenty three. We're also looking at replacing some buses, which will be eight zero emission buses, along with eight full-size transit vehicles and 12 cutaways, equal to 28 buses. We're also looking at continuing to uh, improve our bus stop installation and log with improvement. And we're looking at uh, electrifying our facility for our buses. Uh, one change in this from last month to this month is we included the purchase of the HSC grant uh, which is part of City Merced. The City of Merced is going to contribute seven hundred fifty thousand dollars, and the staff or MTJPA is going to uh, contribute three hundred thousand dollars, which will probably come from Measure B HVIP, which is a high vehicle hybrid voucher, which is about one hundred seventy-five thousand dollars, or we'll go into a uh, capital reserve. So that concludes this presentation. Any questions? Any questions? Uh, Dan, thank you guys for the, the good work on putting the budget together. I just, I want to take the opportunity to comment on, I know I've talked to Stacy about this, but um, just for, for staff, we need to do a little bit job, a little better job um, out in South Dallas Palace. I know we've went to the, the um, micro transit out there. I, again, I'm going to uh, go offline. Uh, I will share with you a resource out there with the little water district. The kind of quasi government agency that operates out in South Dallas Palace, if you will, that would be a good source for us to be able to uh, help get the information out. There's there's a perception out there that the bus doesn't come to South Dallas Palace no more. And I, I was at a coffee there recently and shared with them that's not the case. It's just we don't have the fixed route service. This is probably more advantageous for them because they can, you know, it's app based and they can get the ride when they need it. But just coming up with a plan to be able to. As, as we're progressing through this and we're finding out that it's working, touch bases back with those smaller communities that they're not in the incorporated cities. They don't have the same sources of information, being able to, to have some kind of um, outreach plan to be able to remind folks, because there's a lot of folks out there that, that really this is their only source of transportation. So that's just wanted to um, highlight that while we're talking about the bus and chair, if there are no other further comments, I go ahead and make a motion to approve the um, final 2022-23 operating and capital budget. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. All right, and moved by Director Silvera and uh, seconded by Director Nagy. Is there any public comment on this item? I see none in the house, none online. I'll close public comment. Please call the roll. Director Lewis. Yes. 
Director Hope. Yes. Director McDaniel. Aye. Director Nagy. Aye. Director Silvera. Aye. Chair Pereira. Aye. Thank you, motion carries unanimously. All right, thank you. We'll move to item uh, 8B, uh, Christine Chavez. This is a security contract. Hello. Hi, good afternoon, directors, everyone online. Um, Christine Chavez, transit manager. I have before you a contract um, requesting action to authorize the executive director to enter into a contract for public transit security guard services with the selected vendor Good Guard Incorporated for a maximum term of five years in an amount not to exceed $712,191. So just a little background, um, TJPA has um, historically provided transit uh, security services at the Transpo Center downtown. And um, we have had two different contractors in the past, uh, what is this, 10 years, six years. Um, we had national security and then we had power security group. Um, and then some of the key objectives for security services are passenger safety, uh, facility monitoring um, and patrolling um, and protection of our operators, passengers and um, just customers of the facility, um, crime prevention. And then the security personnel is actually the first responders to um, any sort of emergency situations. Um, and they also call our um, first responders in case there's any sort of emergency. Um, so um, I'm not going to actually go to PowerPoint. So if the people might want to uh, get back, get back to the video. Um, thank you. Though. So the procurement process was done in accordance with the policy and our schedule. Um, the on page 157, you can see the scoring criteria that we went through. There was a selection committee formed of TJPA staff, First Transit staff, and City of Merced staff. Uh, we received five bids um, that are also listed on page 157. And um, as you can see, Good Guard Security is the lowest rate and the highest scored um, evaluation that or the highest scored proposal that we received. So they received the highest evaluation score. Um, so they are being recommended for the contract before you. And so the action I'm requesting is authorizing the executive director to enter into a contract for public security guard services with Good Guard Security for a maximum of five years in an amount not to exceed 712,000. I'm sorry, not to exceed for a contract amount of 712,191. Does anybody have any questions? I can work through that very fast, pretty quickly. Yes. Thank you, Christine. Just help me on the, the change order budget 10%. And I see so the total contracted amount is 712 to our 191. That doesn't take into consideration the 10%. Correct. Okay. So the five year not to exceed contract amount could be potentially 783 410. Yeah, yes, I can I can help uh, with that if you don't mind, Christine. Um, so thank you for the question. I think this is a, 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 a table that we're always looking for feedback on how we can make it a little clearer. So I'm open to some suggestions. What we're trying to do is establish what the contract amount will be when we execute the contract with the with the vendor. So that would be the 712,000. So that tells the vendor this is what the contract is established at. Okay, or whatever that dollar amount is. Alicia is looking at me like, no. Uh, but the idea is we want to establish the contract amount because the change order budget is a, is uh, um, provided to me through our purchasing policy. And so um, we're not including that as an exceed, not to exceed amount when we execute the contract. It is something that as, as on a case by case approval basis, it could um, be approved by the executive director. So what we want to do is establish clearly in the documentation and in our contracts, what the contract amount will be, and then establish that at, at, if needed and if approved by the executive director, up to 10% of that can be um, uh, added on for change orders through that course of that amount. So you're, you're correct. The actual, if we exercised all extension options and I exercise the entirety of the 10%, the actual, at the end of the day, we could spend up to 700 um, and eighty three thousand dollars, but the actual contract amount would um, would be executed for what was proposed. Perfect. No, and, and I appreciate 
like just laying all the cards out there that what it, it could be. I guess the way in my mind it works is that when you put that amount out there, it already kind of tells somebody, oh, you look at there's some room there. That's that that set that extra seventy one thousand, and then and then if you're even going into the two year extensions on that. So you know, I'm thinking, well, listen, if you get through the first three years and you don't you don't have you don't need a change order. That's 41 that's not available. I don't know. It's, it's, I don't know. Let me think about it some more. Like, if, if you're asking me an opinion on how to make a better document, I appreciate that you're giving us here's the all in worst case scenario. We could end up at this, but putting that out there five years without no, having been through one year on it, that kind of, I don't know, that just makes me a little. It's actually a three year and two option one years. Example. It's for, True, the three years, but you're, you're putting it all out there as a five year, if we did the extensions, there's still this karma that you're putting out into the universe that says there's still potentially $71,000 that could be spent. And and, I, and, and I, I'm not saying that this contractor is that way, but I feel like when we put these not to exceed amounts in contracts, which I'm okay with, but it's pretty much, I very rarely do they come back and say, oh, well, you know, we did a really good job. And, you know, you said it was 600,000 was not to exceed, but we, we only spent 550. Usually the bill comes right in at 600,000. You, you see what I'm saying? It's yeah, and what I understand is that the contract is executed at the 170, one, uh, 112, 191, and then the executive director has that 10% authority and she would sign that amendment. And the reason she has to sign that amendment is because we don't want to pay them for the same scope that they've already bid. That said, they said they could do for the one. So, so essentially, the contract that the vendor gets will be executed in the amount that was bid. So it won't have the specified, you know, but I hear you. And I do want to clarify that this table that includes the breakout of the 10% hypothetical um, was part of the um, reorganization of our staff reports from feedback with the TRB. This was a specific request for the TRB to clarify what the proposal of bid, what the bid amount is. The base contract, the bid for that's going to go into the, into the contract, and then what the 10% would be, and then what the potential uh, total would be. So this is a new way of doing it. Um, so um, I'd love to have some further. If you want to, you mentioned thinking it on, thinking on it a little bit more. We can have some more conversation. Yeah, and, and, and the other thing is, is, we're signing a base contract with options, and we've walked, we've kind of locked in what the option price is going to be, but but we're not guaranteeing that we're going to the option. But that we'll take, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Yeah, I, I just, I'm, I'm good with it. I appreciate the work that was done in, in evaluating and, and getting us what looks to be a, a good contractor. I just, I don't know. But anyhow, you know, thank you. Director McDaniel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, have we contracted with this company before? Are they local? Um, they are from Turlock. They have a satellite office in Turlock. Okay. But we have checked references. Okay, thanks. What's the pleasure of the board? Any questions? Any other questions? Seeing none, what's the pleasure of the board? Jen Okay, been moved by Director Nagy. Was that a second? Sure. I'll, I'll, I'll second that. Second by Director. Oh, oh. Ask, ask your question, please. No, no. Oh no. Can I make a recommendation to the uh, to modify the action? Hold on, we have a director with the question. I well for for four hundred and eleven thousand dollars, what what do you get? Does it say on here what you're getting? You're getting a security guard all hours of uh, the operation of our transit service. At the transfer, we have at least one we have one guard standing there. Uh, securing the premise. So they're opening the transit center, they're closing the transit center, they're making sure nothing's going on in the restroom. And it's just one person? Just one person. Making sure nothing's going on on the buses. So it's, I think, 16 hours a day plus weekends, um, excluding holidays. So it's 365 minus seven days a year. Okay, how many days that is? So basically, it's 22 to $24 an hour. Is, is what is, yeah. For 16 hours a day. So are you paying overtime with that? We do not pay overtime, but we do pay for uh, management uh, oversight, um, kind of their payroll or administration, and then we pay their mileage reimbursement. 
And, and it's not a person, it's a service. So that person might be different. Yeah. So the service, they have various employees. So we're not paying for John Smith, who's going to be there every day for that amount of time. It's, it, it's a service that we're being provided. And so, um, you know, how they actually staff that, there's more people. Okay. It's just um, we're providing for the service of one, basically like a, an equivalent of like a full-time security guard. Um, okay. That helps. I understand now. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And it comes out to about 6,000 hours a year. Okay. All right. We have a motion and a second. Uh, is there any public comment on this item? Yeah, I was just going to suggest. Um, Sorry, Chair, I asked her if she had a suggestion. The action Sorry. says authorizing a not to exceed amount of 712-191. And I believe that was corrected in our last um, agenda publishing for the TRB. And so this may be from the CAC. And so it should be not to exceed. It should say um, in an amount and you should strike not to exceed the 712 because we have that 10% um, availability for the executive director. So the request would be striking not to exceed. Is that okay with the make the motion? Yes. Is that okay with the seconder? Yeah. All right. All right. Would you please call the roll on the. Um... Director Lewis? Yes. Director McDaniel? Aye. Director Hogue? Yes. Director Nagy? Yes. Director Silvera? Aye. Chair Pereira? Uh, aye. Thank you. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Joyce. Um, well, I'm finally correct now. We're on item 10A. Uh, Stacy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Uh, this is um, this is a big this is a big action. Uh, and I hope I'm gonna walk you through it uh, with some clarity and I'm happy to answer any any questions? Um, this is the recommendation to approve the selection of our regional transportation plan sustainable community strategy preferred scenario. That's a mouthful. So I'm going to refer to it as the RTP SES. Uh, this is a core planning document that MCAG and other um, uh, regional transportation planning agencies and POs um, uh, uh, do on a uh, every four year basis. It's a, it's a core function. So uh, we are seeking the board to take action to select the preferred scenario for the RTP SES. Once that action is taken and the, the preferred scenario is um, chosen, the draft RTP SES and the corresponding air quality conformity and, and environmental impact report uh, documents will be prepared and released for a 55 day public review period. So this is basically um, recommending the scenario that will go into the draft. The draft will be released. There'll be a public comment period ultimately with the board being asked to adopt or to approve the RTP SES in um, August of this year. Uh, we, the staff recommendation, as we heard from uh, Mr. Smith earlier, uh, is to um, select scenario three, as that was the recommendation that came out of the RTP SES advisory committee on which both directors Faria and Pedrozo participated. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, this is a uh, every four year uh, planning document. It establishes our long term vision uh, for the region's transportation that balances both our future mobility and housing needs with our economic and environmental goals. It um, identifies a combination of transportation and land use policies and strategies to help the region achieve street, um, the state greenhouse gas emission goals and federal Clean Air Act requirements. So if you may recall, uh, for those of you who have gone through an RTP cycle, um, SB 375 uh, required uh, the inclusion of a sustainable community strategy, which is essentially um, the state identifying target percentage reductions of greenhouse gas emissions from um, vehicles. So we're basically say, looking into the future and saying what combination of policies, land use strategies, um, you know, housing densities, transportation investments would, if implemented, help us reduce our greenhouse gas emissions from vehicles um, by X percent. In this year, we have to um, achieve a, a 10 and 14 percent reductions uh, in, in future years. Um, and uh, of course, we also have our federal Clean Air Act requirements that we have to satisfy. 
Um, some years, some cycles, RTP cycles are massive overhauls, meaning you basically start from the inside and, and you're looking at everything. You're really doing an overhaul of your project list. You're looking at an overhaul of your assumptions. This is what's considered a minor update. So we really took the 2018 plan that um, it, we actually just, just this year got approved through um, our um, SES review process through CARB. So the fact that we just got that our, um, SES approval in 2022 from our 2018 plan, we did a minor update of that plan uh, for, this, for the document that we'll be developing right now. Um, I will, on page 177, there's a breakout of the, the scenarios. This, this request is to, um, to adopt a, the preferred scenario. Those scenarios are scenario one being a baseline of kind of an existing uh, levels of investment or, or housing density averages and levels of investment on a various um, number of transportation modes. The second option or scenario two is called conserve Merced County. It, it really looks at more infill, um, more mixed use development with investment with uh, some investments, increased investments in alternative modes. Um, and then the scenario three is conserve and connect Merced County. This is the um, recommended scenario for adoption. Um, it is essentially everything else that's already included in scenario two plus more, more multifamily housing, um, higher densities, more investments in alternative modes. So if you look at these three scenarios, it's baseline, more investment in alt modes and higher densities, and then the most. So you heard Mr. Smith talk about it as um, the most aggressive it is. It has the highest um, housing densities. It has the greatest number of investment or the greatest levels of investment in transit, microtransit expansion onto uh, from the west side to the east side, um, increasing bus frequency, uh, service frequencies. There's a greater emphasis on multifamily um, housing as opposed to single family housing. Um, and lots of mixed use development um, investment as well. So if you look at it as to like what we're doing now, a little bit more, and then even more than that, scenario three is that, and it, that's a very technical way, the even more than that scenario. <laughs> um, what, I, what I do wanna point out is that when you're looking at these, these scenarios, you're really looking at housing density, you're looking at the, um, the preservation of prime ag land. So think of that as a spectrum, right? Some and most, so you're, you're looking at these things as a spectrum. Density for housing, um, single family versus multifamily housing, an emphasis on infill and mixed use, how much ag land is being converted, how much is being invested in transit, how much is being invested in bike ped projects, um, and uh, ride share and van pooling services. So scenario three is the highest level for those. Uh, it has the highest um, investment in those areas and the uh, greatest housing density of 10 point nine units per acre. Um, I should also mention that uh, in scenario three, um, it, it identifies um, a connectivity study to help um, with the, the, the delivery of the passenger rail services with Amtrak and ACE. Um, and of course, invest more in bike ped, rideshare van pooling and non-capacity um, increasing traffic flow improvements. So, um, of these three, uh, scenario three is what's being recommended from the advisory committee. Um, also with our public outreach, it was by and large uh, the, the preferred scenario through our outreach efforts. Um, and I think, you know, for the, on the technical side, the most important thing is that all, um, that scenario three and two and three, that they both meet our air quality conformity and they also meet our um, state GHG reduction targets that I mentioned. Um, in terms of schedule, I'll just uh, reiterate that with this action, it is um, the recommendation of selecting scenario three. The draft will be built around this scenario. We'll go through a public review process with the release of a draft. And then this board would be um, asked to adopt the full plan, not just the scenario, but the plan that's developed around the scenario um, in August. And the last thing I will mention is that um, for the time being, and as it has been over the last, uh, since SB 375 uh, was passed, um, that this is, a, this is a guidance document. So this is, establishes policies and levels of investment and growth um, policies that are going to help guide future investment in our region, but this does not mandate that a local jurisdiction it, um, um, be compliant with 
this document. So that this isn't a, you know, by saying, yes, we're going to adopt a scenario that has a, um, an average housing density of 10.9 units per acre, it doesn't mean then that the city of Dos Palos and Gustine, now we're going to turn around and say, now, what, what's your average housing density? We're going to encourage that and we'll help facilitate those discussions and make sure, and, and your staff are all part of the development of this scenario, um, but it is still a guidance document, not a, um, not a mandate. And I'm happy to answer it. There's a lot of information there, but I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, any questions, yes. Director Silvera? I, I guess more of a comment, Stacey. I appreciate, I think you've been working with us long enough know, now to know, to kind of in your staff report, maybe ask, answer some of the questions. As you were talking, one of the questions that I wrote down over here, what is the penalty if we do not meet the goals of scenario three? So I, I appreciate you saying that. Um, it just, I find it far too often that you get penalized. And Supervisor Chairman Pereira and I just had a conversation about this just not too long before this meeting, not this specific example, but being punished for your good behavior. Um, you know, you do things as, as an organization, as a county or as a city where you're trying to be out on the front of stuff and you're, you're, trying, to, you're trying to make good policy and, and, you know, have good rules. And then all of a sudden the state comes along and, you know, typically behind the eight ball, now there's a crisis and they will try to fix, you know, one problem by creating three more. And then you get penalized for, for doing the right thing. And then the bad actors, if you will, that didn't do anything. Well, it's easy for them to, to, to meet that next goal because they started at zero, right? It, where our baseline has already started higher. So I appreciate you, I appreciate you um, pointing that out to the group and, and it seems to me when, you know, with our citizens advisory committee, as well as, as the TRB agreeing with, with scenario three, I think it's a good place to start. I think it's, it's, it's good to have lofty goals, but still knowing in the back of our head that that's, it's, it's not uniform. It's not going to fit everywhere. I would say, for example, that, you know, when you look at the density numbers, it's probably easier for the city of Merced or the city of Las Panas to achieve those numbers versus the city of Das Palace or Augustine or Livingston. So as long as we all know that going into it, that these are our goals and, and I appreciate that that MCAG staff will, will help anybody and everybody to try to achieve those goals, that we're not going to you know, be penalizing or punishing folks for not being able to meet unrealistic expectations. Thank you. Any other questions? Any directors online have questions? Okay, thank you. Um, I, I do have one. Is um, so you have 7.3, 10.3, and 10.9 units per acre. So well, why do we not have a whole number? Because if somebody has an acre, what do you do? You know, you got to put 11, right? You can't do 10.9. This is a regional average, so I think it's it's you're asking if. And I, I don't know if we have Ty on. Is Ty on as a presenter? Uh, okay, Ty, if you can hear me. Um, I'm not sure if you heard uh, Chair Pereira's question, but was asking specifically about the, the um, fractional units, like we have the 7.3, 10.3, and, and 10.9. I know there's probably some modeling answer here, but I'm sure you can probably take a better stab at it than I can, if you don't mind. Um, yes, sure, thank you. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, thank you. So uh, uh, what Stacy mentioned uh, was correct that, you know, we're looking at like the regional average for density here. So we know like the city of Dos Palos and the city of Gustine won't necessarily hit that density target, but the others will likely meet that and go beyond. So we're looking at a regional average. And then those densities correspond to like a housing mix uh, and that's provided in like your uh, the the tables in the staff report. So it shows like you know the percentages of like multifamily homes versus like single family homes, and then the single family homes are even broken down into like those on larger lots versus smaller lots. So and you see like the progression of like by scenario of like uh, progression or the shift towards more. Uh, multifamily to meet like those regional uh, goals of the scenarios. 
And Ty, just to just to clarify, uh, and the the fact that the output is a it has a, um, a fraction of a of a unit. So if it's ten point three or ten point nine, that's a model output. That I mean that that's a calculation output that took in a variety of different um, combinations of housing types. That when you're looking for an average, it spits out a a, fra a fraction of a unit. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ty. It's a pleasure of the board, or yeah. Chair Silvera, motion to approve the selection of option three for the RTP SCS preferred scenario. Okay, is there a second? I'll second. Okay. We have a motion by Director Silvera, a second by Director Ho. At this time, I'll block the public comment. Nope. Okay. There's uh, no public comment online. No, no public comment in the house. I'll close public comment. Uh, please call. Director Lewis. Yes. Director Hogue. Yes. Director McDaniel. Aye. Director Nagy. Aye. Director Silvera. Aye. Chair Pereira. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries unanimously. All right. Thank you. I will move to item uh, B. The contract minute with Trinity Consultant, Stacey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, in January of this year, um, I executed a sole source contract with Trinity Consultants, Inc. for on-call professional and air quality planning and conformity support services in an amount of $29,000. Um, Trinity Consultants is the uh, firm that has uh, been on board with our Valley, all eight of our Valley counties that um, for our um, consolidated or the air quality conformity activities that we do as a region, you know, we're in one air basin. And so we have um, a contract as a region with Trinity to help with those valley-wide air quality conformity um, efforts. Um, it was um, anticipated and we were experiencing a need to call on Trinity more than what was, um, I guess, uh, appropriate for a valley-wide contract. We needed more targeted one-on-one -on -one, um, uh, consultation for a number of reasons, um, largely uh, for our, our TPSES, uh, for those the calculations that we needed um, for that effort. Um, and uh, so we did a sole source contract because it was specifically Trinity that we needed additional support in addition to what they were providing us through our valley-wide contract. Um, the, what we also, uh, and why we're looking to do an amendment to increase this dollar amount is that um, there are new EPA um, guidelines, regulations, evaluations at the project level that are happening for federal uh, federalized projects. And uh, we had a jurisdiction, um, and in fact, it, it was uh, the Outwater Merced Expressway that was going through this level of, of EPA um, analysis that um, needed a considerable amount of technical assistance um, to help get the project over this hurdle with EPA uh, requirements. And so we, um, um, this, our Alex Marcucci, our, our uh, staff person through Trinity that's been working with us, has been instrumental in helping us um, get AME through this EPA regulation hurdle. It's something that we may need to be focusing on and there actually is probably going to be a need for us to be looking at a longer term contract with Trinity or a, a firm like this because this is probably a reoccurring issue. But the issue at hand today is that that was an unexpected um, uh, use of the contract that we intended to be for the RTPSES. So we have uh, worked with Trinity to establish um, an estimate that we would like to increase this $29,000 contract to um, $54,000. And that would also, uh, under the existing scope, allow to not only help with the AME issue and any other kind of um, air quality issue that would come up for at the project level, but most importantly, is to make sure that there's budget on the contract to uh, ensure her support through our RTP SES development and approval process, um, which will involve actual like a defense process through the um, California Air Resources Board. So we are uh, requesting an amendment. Uh, that amendment does require board action because it will exceed my authority um, of $30,000. And there's no term to the contract. It will be until funds are expended or the work is done. Okay. Thank you. Director McDaniel. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I support this. Um, I think the help that they were able to provide for AME alone 
was tremendous, and I see every hurdle of us moving forward, we're going to have to tap into their knowledge and their help. So I definitely, and if no one else, I'll make the motion and wait for a second after the comments. Any other discussion? Yes. Thank you, Chair. Mm -hmm. um, Stacy, I found something that maybe we can change. I think this is just, would you call it a change order? I got, when I think about a change order, I think a construction project. I think it, they, I like it better called a contingency because it really is, it's a, it's, I don't know, it's different when we're talking about services. I think that's probably something that kind of just throws me. That was just my brain not functioning at a high level. It, you're right, it is not a change order. That's why I misspoke. It, it's an amendment to a service contract um, that would basically just be adding additional funding to, that we're not changing the scope of work or anything like that. We're just basically exceeding or we're um, increasing the max budget for the services under the existing contract. If you're correct, it's not a change order. Well, then that's put on the 10% contingency. I like to call it oh. call a contingency and not a change order. Got it. I know that's getting really in the weeds on it, but when I when I think change order, I think like, a, again, a construction project. And so because of the, Got it. Because of the 10% contingency, and then you're asking for an additional 29,000, that's what takes it over your $30,000 limit. The original contract was 29,000. My limit is 30,000. So we would be, we're proposing to add to the 29 to get to 54. So that mm -hmm, we're adding the 25. Again, the, the max contingency budget of 10% is, would not be, um, factored into the, the executed contract. It's an authority provided to me separate in our purchasing policy. So the contract would be 54,000. But in the event there was, you know, I, I don't even, I, this is a contract where I couldn't even see us using it, but um, in the event we needed to add a task or uh, what have you, I would have up to 10% that would require um, my approval before I, I get that part of it. I'm good with it. I, and I'm going to second the motion. I just, I guess I'm, I'm having a hard time following how this exceeds your $30,000 authority. Because the 29,000 never came to the board. The 29,000 right. I executed without board approval. So if, as soon as that contract goes to 30,000, it has to come to the board. Perfect. Thank that, you. That Sorry makes sense. I, for, I, thought, I thought we already approved the 29 and now you're asking for 25 and I couldn't figure out how that got over your 30. Thank you for explaining. I have a motion by Director McDaniel, a second by Director Silvera. Any other comments, questions? Nope, not online, okay. I'll open up for public comment. No public comment. Bring it back to the dais, please call the roll or the vote. Director Lewis? Yes. Director Hogue? Yes. Director McDaniel? Aye. Director Nagy? Aye. Director Silvera? Aye. Chair Pereira? I vote aye. Thank you. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Well, we'll move to item 11, discussion items. Uh, a, a draft uh, I-5 freight sewer emissions route operations pilot study. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. I got jokes over here. <laughs> oh, man. And I have to say, I, I know I'm, I'm going to try to be brief on this item. Um, Thank you for that presentation. Yeah, <laughs> the, I, I actually don't need to make a presentation. This is just not a topic that I have shared with the board yet, and I want to just call your attention to it. Um, it is the draft I-5 freight zero emissions route operations zero pilot study. It is probably now at this point final, um, but I have been a bit out of pocket these last few weeks, um, and I, I do know it's been finalized. I'll just say briefly that this was an effort of the eight transportation planning agencies in the Valley um, that we sponsored a study to explore zero emission freight options along the I-5 corridor. Again, this is another one of our Valley-wide activities trying to look at air quality improvements. Um, with zero emission technologies. So the study was conducted, um, the lead on the, on the project was Kern Cog on behalf of the Valley, and it was conducted by the Sustainable Freight Research Program at the Institute of Transportation Studies at UC Davis. Um, it was funded uh, by um, some excess planning funds that King's 
uh, County Association of Governments um, had in partnership with Caltrans and the San Joaquin Valley Air Pollution Control District and the California Air Resources Board. So um, the objective, as I mentioned, of the study was to uh, look at zero emission technologies for potential implementation along um, the I-5 corridor. I've included the draft final report. Um, I will get the final final. Uh, we'll put it on our website, but I wanted to make sure that um, this was not something MCAG put any funding towards because it was um, all contributed by the partner parties I just mentioned, but I did want the actual report um, some, to be something that you all are aware of and I'll make sure if it didn't go in the TRV packet, it's all been a fog. I'll make sure the final gets distributed and it's just for your information. Thank you, any questions of Stacey? <clears throat> okay, we'll go to item uh, 11B. this is like the most I've had on the agenda and like the worst meeting for it to be. <laughs> I'm, I'm fizzing, I'm fizzling out. Okay, so this item, um, <laughs> this item um, is for the Merced County SAFE, the Service Authority for Freeway Emergencies. Um, this was an item that um, Director Hogue had requested um, several months back. Um, and was postponed last month uh, to ensure that she was here for this for this discussion. Um, just a, the quick background here is, you know, we we operate as the SAFE, the Service Authority for Freeway Emergencies. Um, it is a program that's funded uh, with our car vehicle registrations in Merced County that contribute a dollar, um, and it is administered here at this board. Um, we have historically operated a call box program. Um, previous board uh, uh, several years ago reduced our call box program um, with the advent of cell phones and and um, and just the, the technologies were there. The, the, the call box program on the highways was just not as used as much. And we were at a place where the call boxes were in need of um, updating to uh, better technologies. And so we reduced, we went through a public outreach program uh, actually, it was in 2016 um, with our previous executive director, two executive directors ago, um, and we reduced the program to just maintain along the Highway 152, kind of over the Pacheco Passes, uh, to um, where the cell phone service is not always very uh, strong. So what that has meant is that we've continued to accrue these funds. And we have a surplus of $3.4 million in safe um, uh, funds. There, the, the legislation that identifies what is a, an available kind of effort or use of these funds um, is, is somewhat specific, but it's the kind of language that says, here are examples, it's not all inclusive, but anything that kind of falls outside of what is in the kind of traditional use or hasn't been approved by uh, or in put into place with other call box programs does require um, a, a, a pretty significant kind of um, program development review discussion with Caltrans and with the California Highway Patrol. Um, so I mentioned that because I think what uh, came from the city of Dos Palos several uh, years ago, quite frankly, with the, uh, the previous um, city manager was the idea of being able to use some of these funds to support dispatch services in the communities that were picking up the service calls that were coming in um, from the highways. If people were using their cell phone on the highway to call in for service or what have you, instead of a call box, that those were being handled and there was an increase in volume at the jurisdictional level. Um, our um, um, research into uh, whether or not this would be an eligible use has determined that it is not either, it's not specified in the law and it is not a program that is in existence anywhere else which doesn't mean it can't be done. It just means we would need to develop a, a, a plan, a proposal, a program to kind of identify how it would work and go through a review and discussion process with the California Highway Patrol and with Caltrans. So that's, that's probably, it's not the easiest answer, but it's not no. It's just, we need to, um, it's a little bit more of a formal process to get to that answer than just, you know, we, we've checked the regulations, we've asked the appropriate questions, and now it would just require some, some exploration. The staff report does include on page 4, 16 and 17, quite a bit of information about what other uh, safe programs do. But um, I think the spirit of this item was, could it be used for these dispatch support services? So if you want to talk about any of the others, I'd be happy to. Um, but what we are recommending, this is just an information item, so it's more for discussion or getting some general direction. But what we would be uh, recommending to kind of explore as next steps would be to um, 
upgrade our current call box network to make sure it stays up. So the, the call boxes that exist still over the like, up into Pacheco to make sure that they remain operational. And then um, go out to bid for consultant support that has the, um, the experience with safe modernization and do um, the necessary process of developing this proposal for consideration by CHP and Caltrans for the dis dispatch support um, as, a, as a use. I should also mention that while we have 3.4 million in surplus, annually we accrue about 220,000. Um, so of course, like anything else, when you're using surplus funds, you wanna make sure that anything you put in place is sustainable with ongoing revenue. Um, but we do have quite a bit uh, accrued. And then um, we only use for our existing call box, we only use about 6,000 annually. That doesn't include upgrades. That just means for the actual call boxes um, maintenance that we have now. So we have funding to work with. Um, we have funding to work with. So again, this is just a discussion item. If there's anything um, else you would like us to look into, but um, if not, this is not action. Um, the direction that we would continue on at this point is to bring on um, a consultant to, to develop the program that um, we would need to submit to the level of which we'd need to submit to uh, Caltrans and CHP for a review specifically on the dispatch service. Um, Stacey, I, I, I mean, I think that's a good use of the funding. Uh, something else I'd like to just, I guess, put on the radar is that um, the county is looking at redoing our communication system because there are pockets uh, out in Gustine, there's pockets up in uh, towards, uh, uh, Cafe's Valley. And, and so we're, it's a $17 million upgrade to the communication system, which may be a way to eliminate the call boxes if we can create mm. uh, a system, right? And then, uh, and then all that 200, you know, uh, I mean, and then we could, you know, I mean, I, I think help and dispatch who's handling the, the issues, if that makes sense to me too. And Just a thought to maybe discuss it here. And I do appreciate that because I know when we were doing, when Margie and I were doing the outreach in 2016 about this, the idea of, of keeping those call boxes was because of the cell service. And one of the things of the recommendations that came out of that was looking at actually using some of the surplus funds to help establish a cell tower in that area of the county, um, but that was determined to not be an eligible use for the funds. But but I, that's I'm familiar with that effort through our One Voice program, so I can definitely um, have that discussion. Thank I you. would think that uh, uh, if we can develop the, the communication system, that benefits us. You know, 90% of the people who would probably use a call box aren't from Merced County, and we're paying for it. So, anyways, okay, Supervisor McDaniel. Yeah, if I could, um, it's an interesting use of the funds if it is available, because I know the city of Livingston, um, when we go through a lot of their, they get dispatched all the time for 99, as, as well as the city of Atwater for 99. And they're always looking for some kind of restitution or something to help them out with that, because it, it is a burden on their system. And uh, I've heard that mentioned in many meetings. So it'd be nice if we could come up with something like that. Okay. Well, I concur. Um, you know, we get hit up for I-5 over in, in Justine, as I'm sure Los Banos does also, I-5-152. Um, it's interesting that, you know, we, we've had this money building up to $3.4 million. We really need to look at what we want to do with this. And as technology has advanced, you know, maybe that cell tower now is a viable option where it wasn't a few years ago. Uh, that's one thing, but I also think we need to, as a group here, decide kind of what we want to go towards. And, and if it's reimbursement of dispatch, I, not to ruffle any feathers, but how does that come under uh, Highway Patrol and Caltrans overview? I mean, I can see when it's a, when you're, when you're, uh, they're responding, because it looks like when they respond to a call box, that it comes out of the, this funds, these funds pay for it. So if somebody's on the side of the road and they use their cell phone, these funds don't pay for it. Correct. So I don't understand why these funds pay for it in one instance, but not in another. It it's it's, it's because those calls specifically go through a CHP Caltrans approved mechanism of the call box. 
Uh, that's what the money right. is there has been there for. So, so basically what we would be doing is with those cell phone calls that go to your jurisdiction dispatch, it's just, a st I, I mean, I'm, I'm oversimplifying it, but the idea would be to basically, the logic is if you need help and you're on the highway, these funds should and to, should address those calls. Right now, just on a technicality, they aren't. So this would be developing a program that would get, um, and, and it requires CHP and um, Caltrans approval because of the funding mechanism, the actual reg statutory um, requirements. So for them to be um, utilized, the safe dollars being utilized for the jurisdictional dispatch, we would need to have it basically established. I always thought of it as being something where we would have to have some kind of either a data tracking, uh, so you'd be a, be a reimbursement based on the number of calls on the on the corridors, on the state highway corridor. So there'd have to be some kind of mechanism built in, but it's really a technicality at this point. Um, so I think logistically, as long as, I, I don't wanna, I anticipate that as long as we would have a strong enough of a mechanism in place to make sure that this wasn't just a cut checked for dispatch services at the jurisdictional level and some kind of an actual reported here are the volume of calls we received from callers on Highway 152 or on I-5, that if we could clarify that to the, so that these funds were only being used for those calls, I don't see that being a problem. It's just making sure we could have a program in place that would be able to differentiate a call on Highway 152 that's a service call that if a call box was there or they needed it, they would use it versus that jurisdiction's general emergency dispatch call service. We would just need to be able to identify it. Right. Yeah, and that's that's great I, yeah. because I think the whole point of this is to make our roads safer, yeah. and us sitting on 3.4 million and accumulating 220 thousand dollars a year isn't making our roads any safer. So I I think it's a good idea to look into. And there are other options, you know, the the dispatch we can the dispatch um, service we could you know is going to be the focus. But you know others have freeway cleanup programs. They have a freeway service patrol where they just have like a patrol service tow truck, what have you, that is doing a patrol in certain peak times just to help people that are stranded or what have you. So there, there are other options. So um, I think if we're going to spend some of these funds to, to look at how we could address a problem that we know we already have, it would be what other recommendations are there to consider? What other things make sense for a county of our size with the vehicle traffic of our, you know, uh, at our rate? So I, I, I wouldn't want to completely limit this, this, this study to just the dispatch, but I think the dispatch is a problem we know we have and a potential solution that we already have um, identified. So um, there will definitely be more and there'll have to be public outreach as well. So this is just getting that initial direction from the board. Um, or I guess it's to kind of uh, speak up if you have concerns of taking this approach. There will be a number of different ways this comes back to you as we start the process. Director Silvera. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, to be honest with you, I think call boxes, I would love to know on an annual basis how many times they actually get used. I, I, I would venture to guess that it's slim and none. Um, well, he's not here no more. Uh, you know, in traveling over 152, yes, there's some dead spots, but heck, I got a dead spot in El Nido every time I come through there. So, and, and, and with, with technology, with cell phones, I don't know anybody that doesn't have a cell phone. I, I literally cannot in my mind tell you somebody right now that I know that doesn't have a cell phone. Is there people out there that exist that don't have cell phones? I'm sure there are, but, but and I'm talking, I'm, I'm talking go walk the rail trail in Las Vegas where a lot of homeless people have, have taken up shop, they all got cell phones. Um, you, you can go to the Taco Bell in Las Banas and go to the plugs outside and they're plugging in to charge their cell phone. So, and, and really going over 152, having done it quite a bit recently, you might lose spot for a small area, but then, you know, you drive down the, you drive down the road just a little bit, you got service back. I just think that they're really, and you can see what we're putting into them cost-wise, it's not a whole lot of deal. I, I'd be, I, I, I'd love to explore just abandoning the whole, we're not in a mountainous county where you have miles upon miles with no cell service where it probably makes a lot more sense. And when we put them in, they probably did, but looking at ways to, to help with the, the onset, with the onset of cell phones, those calls are getting, they're, they're coming directly into the dispatch centers here. So I would be in favor of looking at that as, as a potential possibility, um, to be able to, to utilize those funds to help out our local jurisdictions, because I do agree with the chair. 
on the state highways, you know, the 152s, the I-5s of the world. Yes, there are local people that use those, but but a lot of those people, I mean, my time as a volunteer fireman, the majority, the super majority of the accidents that we responded to were for people that were from Northern California, Southern California, that were just using that as a pass-through. So just my thoughts. Um, yes, uh, Deborah. Thank you. Um, I, I travel over 152 frequently into the Bay Area. And, um, you know, the, the drop off points are uh, at the top of Dinosaur Point, uh, coming down off the grade, um, just about the entire route until you get over the dam and down into the flat point where the four bay is. You may start picking it up then. So it's, it's a, a, a bit of a stretch there. And yes, most everybody has a cell phone, but um, you know, there could be a scenario where somebody may have forgotten their cell phone or it's not charged up, it's, it's run down. And I, I would hate to see somebody caught in that long stretch of, of uh, 152 until they get on the flatland uh, before any cell service comes in. Um, and it's not often that you see a highway patrol uh, traveling that area, it's very rare. So uh, where do they walk? I, I think the one call box that I, I recall seeing is kind of at the top where Dinosaur Point is. So um, it, it just brings me a little bit of pause that we would even consider eliminating, uh, you know, the one call box that's on that route, you know, even though that, that would be a long distance for anybody to have to walk to get help or services. And we live in a society now where uh, people aren't very helpful anymore to stop and help you or call for you uh, when you're in a distress moment. So um, I, I certainly wouldn't be in favor of, of eliminating a call box on 152 because uh, that dead spot is is quite a distance for someone to have to walk uh, to get uh, services, despite the fact that it, it, I think there's only one up there. If and, and I may be wrong, there may be two, but that's what I kind of remember seeing one up there on the Merced side when you get to the top of Dinosaur Point. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, and I, I, I agree. I, I, we're only spending, I believe, $6,000 a year on the call boxes. So those could stay in place and we'd still have plenty of money to, to provide additional or reimburse for additional services. So I, I think your points well taken. I was thinking the same thing as Director Severo was talking. You know, it's that one time when your daughter's driving over or, you know, or your wife or your somebody and, and they don't have a way to get help. And, and uh, then when you pull over, right, you're dead on the road, you're at the mercy of whoever stops. Mm -hmm. And good people probably don't stop as much because of the danger, but bad people sure will. So um, anyways, good comments. Thank you. And that was just discussion item. Okay. Any other discussion? Nope. All right. Thank you. We will move to uh, item 13, uh, Mercer County Regional Waste Authority, the uh, draft operating capital and fleet budget for 22 23. Now, I agree. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, before you is a presentation of our uh, 22 23 RWA budget for operations, fleet, and CIP. We'll go through the challenges that we had in 21 22 accomplishments along with the budget summary for 22-23 that will go over our operations, operation budget, our fleet budget, and the CIP, and also talk about a little bit of our master plan that we'll bring to this board in the future year of uh, next steps. Um, from here, I'll let Eric take over. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you, Noah. Uh, so RWA budget. So some of the key challenges in this last fiscal year, year that we dealt with were obviously the landfill gas energy project with UC Merced, uh, Senate Bill 1383, which came in in 2016 and really ramped up the discussions for RWA this last year. Uh, airspace, you know, if you recall mid-year, we had a mid-year budget uh, authorization for to include the Billy Wright cell expansion, uh, which is going very well, by the way. Um, and then composting orders, everything that we've been doing as it relates to the state's composting orders are on hold. 
um, for us until we make a decision on the 1383 facility. So those have been some challenges for us. Um, some of the fiscal year achievements for 21-22 is that we've had no interruption of our landfill operations. Um, overall, we've seen an 8% increase or thereabouts uh, in tonnages. Um, we've completed five groundwater monitoring wells and two pump and treat wells at Highway 59 landfill gas collection and control system. Uh, as mentioned, we terminated the MOU with UC Merced on the landfill gas energy project. We hosted and assisted in uh, household hazardous waste and community cleanup, cleanup events throughout Merced County. And we purchased some additional uh, fleet, equip fleet equipment, which you know, going back to that, I will tell you, uh, we are still waiting to receive one of those heavy pieces of equipment. So we have not been immune to some of the equipment woes uh, in the nation. Um, fiscal year 22-23 draft budget priorities. We want to continue to maintain staffing to support operations at both landfill sites, uh, maintain and update equipment for effective and efficient operation, um, continue to pay down our 2025 uh, municipal bond debt, uh, which is good news. We're about 11 million is what we're in debt to. I think that's a 2027 is when that's paid off. So we're looking good there. Uh, continue to fund the closure fund and post-closure fund, uh, complete capital projects, um, you will see in your monthly report, we include now quarterly to you Air Force Air Space study calcs so that you will know how our airspace is at both regional sites. Um, so we'll continue to do that. Composting orders we're going to have to do, and that's going to be something that is due in August. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that in, in subsequent meetings, but it is something that's required for both, both sites. And then of course, the 1383 um, uh, procurement item. We'll talk a little bit more about that in the next uh, item. And of course, maintain regulatory compliance. So, um, sorry, I was on the wrong slide. Summary. Priorities. Okay. So, some of our projected revenues, uh, we are looking at uh, projecting revenue very conservatively. And so, we, we last year's budget was uh, approved for revenues of 15.5 million. Uh, we're projecting a 16.3 million overall revenues. Um, for our total operating expenses, we were at 11.2 last year. We are this year proposing 11.8. Most of both of these numbers are conservative estimates. Um, our fleet purchases, we are dipping. Excuse me. Oh, sorry. sorry. Yes. How come interest rates are going up? Why is our projected interest going by down by 25,000? So it's, it's the money that we have in our county pool, right? And so since we're doing this big project site with the two landfills, that's less money we have in our investments. Perfect, thank you. Good question. Any other questions? Uh, in our fleet purchase, because, you know, in the past for landfill heavy equipment, it's taken anywhere from four to six months to get equipment. We are looking at 12 to 16 months. We are making uh, two large purchases in the fleet fund where we're purchasing two large pieces of equipment to help out with operations for a total of $3.19 million. This is a list of our current capital improvement projects. The authority leverages somewhere in the order of $30 million capital improvement projects. That's the balance of which, and these are the projects that you see before you for both sites. Um, we'll continue to kind of, you know, these as, as permits are issued, as regulatory uh, uh, approvals are given, that's when we can actually move forward on some of these projects. Um, for our capital improvement project, we, as we came last year with a big year uh, budget, uh, approval for the Billy Wright landfill sale expansion. We really captured some of the money that we would have been using in this next budget year. And so you'll see that we are moving funds amongst the CIP projects. And for this budget, we're only asking for 100,000 for, um, for a new project. And that, that's it there. For, um, and that's the Billy Wright landfill gas and control monitoring wells. Um, and that's, that's it there. So some of the movements uh, between the capital improvement fund that you see before you here, we're, we're moving $3 million uh, from three CIP projects and we're morphing that $3 million amongst the various products that you see for Billy Wright and Highway 59. Of note to these projects, I will tell you that the admin building uh, construction project, I plan to come back to this body and, and give you guys an update on that project. Um, that project was started by my predecessor before I, I came on board. There is a three phase component project. It's an admin building, it's a maintenance building, and then it's a uh, resource recycling uh, infrastructure move out of the Valley Field area uh, project. So it's a three phase project. 
the admin building itself has gone from a $5 million build to a 5.8 million just on its own right. And the overall project has gone from 9.8 to 13.8. And that is over the span of, of just eight months. So we're seeing these costs go quicker than we can establish revenues for. Um, but again, this is a project that I plan to give you guys um, the master plan and we'll seek direction from this body as to how to move forward on those funds. So this chart here tells you some of the increases and decreases of those uh, the three million and the projects that was just spelled out in the slide before gives you uh, where we're taking that money and where it's swapping. So the overall budget summary, we're looking at a capital improvement broad projects budget. Uh, the existing fund is 34 million. Uh, the total fund is, is uh, 35 million. We have available 296,000 remaining in that fund with this proposal. Operating cash, we uh, plan to have a positive cash flow of 26,000. And our fleet fund, we will still remain a, a $1.1 million fleet fund. Any questions? Any questions? Any raised hands online? from our directors. Just, yes, Supervisor or uh, Director Silvera. Thank you, Chair. Eric, you could go back to the slide, but Jim Ann has two back. One more, one more, right there. So on, on the decreases, what are the reasons for the decreases? We just, we came in under budget on them? No, so we are on the gas collection system. It is a project that we'll have to put out and continue to do as we go through the you know, the operating of the sites. So it doesn't change, uh, but rather it doesn't put priority to some of those increases that we would do otherwise if we had the funds to do it. It puts them at the back burner and puts the admin building in a, in a bigger priority. Okay, and then when you, when you talk about that administrative, that deal that was now so 13 million and it was started by your predecessor. And so I guess like one of the things that I see at, at, at the 59 landfill, and I think we're getting better at it is, is when we're when we're relocating these things, I, I don't want us to be in a position that okay now when we close out this cell now we got to relocate it again or, or we we're looking at centralizing these these you know we're, we're investing money into capital to put these facilities and make them to where they're universal so that as the landfill expands and, and you go into different phases of the, the landfill we're still using those same service those those same facilities is that that's the case? Yeah, the maintenance building it's at the Highway 59 site right now is dilapidated. It's really in some cases unusable. Um, and the scale, the old scale house is all devoted over there. And some of the access points are uh, challenging. You know, it goes outside of where we normally direct the public to access those areas of services now. So it's an improvement on that to improve on circulation and putting things together in what's already there. But it is exactly uh, as you stated. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, I had one on the admin building. You said 5.8 million. How many square feet are you looking at? You know, I don't have that before you today, but I plan to have that at our next meeting. Um, and, and just if I could, uh, Nob is, is wanting me to mention that for the additional staffing, uh, we are proposing in this budget one additional heavy uh, equipment mechanic. So that is the additional staff that we have asked for in this budget. Um, what that is going to do is that's going to put now one heavy equipment mechanic at the right and one heavy equipment mechanic now at 59. That's where the heavy equipment mechanic is now. That gets you close to where you were before we had the cuts. Uh, you did have that at one time. Um, what you have now is that when we have facility equipment that's down at, at Billy Wright, the individual must then drive to that location, spend the time on a repair, and then drive back. And in many cases, there's a need for a second employee to help with leverage and, and things of that nature. So, uh, just thank you. Any other questions? And the current um, heavy equipment mechanic is based uh, out of Los Banos or 59? 59. 59. And, and has an interest in moving to Los Banos or not? Uh, that, I, that I don't know. Um, uh, that I don't know. Okay. All right. No other questions? Any public comment online? No? Okay. No. Thank you for that. All right. Well, thank you. Yes. And that concludes that PowerPoint. So you can go ahead and remove that PowerPoint. I'm here for the next one. So. For the next what? Item. Oh, um, yeah. So we're on to item 13B. 
uh, the SB 1383 organic waste process. Or exits. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a discussion item. That, uh, this is not uh, any decision making on this. As you know, 1383 uh, came in in 2016. Uh, I won't bore you with all of the legislation, but in 2019, um, formal rulemaking was made. Um, it was then adopted in the fall of 2020. Uh, January 1 of 2020, you had a 50% reduction in organic waste disposal, which was required. Uh, and then January 1 of 2022 is when the regulation actually took effect. And so now the jurisdictions are in a position where they've got to provide organic waste disposal um, uh, for their businesses and for their residential populations. Um, so we have issued, uh, the board directed uh, RWA to, to go out and issue a procurement. We've issued that procurement in November uh, and, of last year. And so from there, we had an ad, we went and uh, we have an ad hoc committee team from the TRB, uh, which makes up they are the evaluating committee team that's going to be looking and scoring the evaluation of the bids that we received. We did receive bids. I'm not here to discuss what those bids entail, but we're going through that process. We're now looking at facilities. And so we've been to uh, three different facilities in Los Angeles uh, this a couple of weeks ago. And uh, we're planning to go see one of the bidders in Texas uh, next week. And so the jurisdictions are all included or at least invited for those, uh, those meetings. Um, and so we do have uh, the city of, cities of uh, Atwater, Merced County, Merced, Livingston that have all been invited and have participated in these ad hoc committees. So the actual proposals will be sent to them uh, very soon um, where they will get to see some of the uh, negotiations intent to negotiate with uh, the contracts. And so really the rubber will hit the road very in the coming weeks for pricing. And so I guess my big message to you all and we came out of the TRB, the TRB has instructed staff to make a subcommittee made up of those jurisdictions, Livingston, Atwater, Merced, Merced County, uh, to really dive into this a, a little bit deeper. And really the three options for all of the jurisdictions are to put a facility at Highway 59 for the, for, let me back up, this is really just a Highway 59 conversation. This is not a Los Manos uh, Belly Wright conversation because of the uh, hauler that the West Side, you know, have, have gone in contact with. <laughs> And, and I appreciate that, but, but the, the Billy Wright landfill doesn't only service the city of Los Manos, so I don't want it to be lost. You have, you have Gustine, you have, and I'm not a specific, I know everybody has their specific contracts, but on the west side, if they're not going somewhere else, those organics got to go to Billy Wright, city of Das Palace, and then you have the unincorporated areas of the county. And, and again, you know, I, one of my our predecessors that was on this board always was concerned about the west side, and, and it may it may make sense to build a facility over here on the east side, but everybody else over there now is going to pay additional costs when we have a landfill right in Los Banas that it could go to. So I, I just I guess that's where I have my issue is is it's that we're focusing on I, I know where the majority of the population is. And I know the city of Las Banas, because of their renewal of their contract, has already kind of taken their portion of it. But that still leaves the rest of those areas that typically would go to 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 the uh, Billy Wright landfill just kind of out of luck. So they're they're going to pay the increased cost if we stick the facility over on Merced. That's I, I have I have issues with that. I just want to put that on the record. Sure. And if I if I could. Very good point, and thank you for asking the question. We currently at both regional sites do not offer food waste collection. You know, we, you can't right. take food waste to Billy Wright or to Highway 59. So we're not permitted to accept those streams. Um, the uh, Billy Wright site does have project CIP number 80053, which is just over, you know, $800,000 for the intent of putting a 1383 compliance option there for that site if ever the board directs us to do that. Um, we haven't pursued that because currently Los Panos, who is the largest hauler for that west side, has a 10-year agreement with Mid-Valley Disposal, which offers organic waste collection. And so therefore, there was not a move to, to move on that for that site as of now. Um, and that's really where we, we began to generate, uh, well, what is the east side going to then do for 1383? And so when HF and H came, they presented an item that that item listed all of the contracts that were coming up for renewal for each of the jurisdictions to say that your contract, your hauler was ending at this time. And then when those action plans were provided to each of the jurisdictions, this would have been back in 2020, the jurisdictions were then given options to say either negotiate with your hauler and establish for organic waste 
disposal services, um, or we have a discussion with the authority to find out if the authority needs to have a facility for you to bring your material to. Does that provide? I, Eric, I, I appreciate it. I mean, it, it, and I get where you guys are coming from. It just, I, this, the whole 1383 thing, if I had my way, we would just sue the state of California because it is putting, you know, at the state level, they love to talk about the underserved, the unserved equity. And, and this is going to most adversely affect those folks because it is going to go right directly. These costs are going to have to be borne by somebody and they're going to be borne by them on, on something that, you know, when you, they got these little tiny miniature garbage cans, you know, it's like four and one in San Francisco and all these places. And they make these rules that rural California has to deal with. And, and nobody, everybody's afraid to push back on the state. And I'm telling you, I know that if, I'm going to speak, put my supervisor Silvera hat on for a second. We're, we're still waiting to see what's this going to cost actually to our residents to, 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 to initiate a third or a fourth can. And I'm not sold on it. I, it I, I'm not sold that I'm in favor of that. Can, can I make a comment? Um, when you say that that we're, we're proposing to have organic waste at these two sites, right, the one site or whatever, um, th this SB 13 whatever came about in what year? 2016. Okay. And some of the smaller towns had waivers this whole time to try and get away from this so that we wouldn't have to have the organics. But all of a sudden, we were kind of forced into taking um, a contract with somebody because they took the organic waste. So it's kind of, we do this, so you have to go with us because it's coming down the pike and we're going to have to do this anyway. But I, I, as a, a business owner, um, they didn't tell me that the commercial waste was going to be through 85% higher than it was before. So I went from a paying $79 to $215 a month. Um, and what is, I, I just, I just think that it kind of got thrown at us when if it's already gone through 2016, we should have been more proactive and making sure that the landfills had organics so that we could have an option of who we could go with instead of being forced to go with a contract of somebody because, hey, we, we haul organics. So I just think that it all kind of came about the wrong way and it, and it did, it forced the smaller towns to go, what the heck are we supposed to do with 105 weather and organic sitting in our, you know, for a whole week, or is it going to get picked up or whatever it might be. So I just think that I, I'm, I'm with Scotty here on the, on how upset people are. Although Dos Palos is doing their part, um, I can't figure out when any, anything is getting picked up from the, the hauler that we have. So <laughs> our stuff doesn't get picked up very often, but um, anyway, but the, but the, the pricing was is astronomical. So FYI. Yeah, thank, thank you for that. And that's in your packet, you have the three options, DBO facility, the design, build, operate facility, MRF material recycling facility for organic waste at Highway 59, um, a processing and transport. And if we did processing and transport, you've got transport fuel costs, you've got processing costs um, together with a tip fee, right? So there, there's multiple costs and this is gonna be a multi-million dollar potentially contract depending upon what, what's gone on. But that's why we did it when we did the procurement, we did a design build operate where the proposer could propose to you know finance and and there are grants available for these facilities in high dollar, high millions of dollars. Um, but you can't get you can't tap into them until it is it is built. So the message here and and Director Hogue, I completely agree with, with everything. And Director Silvera, you both are right on. This is not a happy topic for any jurisdiction to have. And uh, we're here as directed by the board to provide an option for the jurisdictions. And that's the procurement that we're putting out. So this is really just to let you know that this is coming around very, very soon. Also, I, I want to note that we are planning to meet with the jurisdictions 
first before we come back to this body so that they can be prepared. HF and we've got some money in the budget to allow for HF and H to have a conversation with the jurisdictions and their elected, their councils to, to discuss this before we come to this body with any type of recommendation. We will make sure this goes to the technical review board first. Yes, Director Nady. Well, I'm gonna put my dunce hat on just for a minute. <laughs> oh. Anyway, I think it's unanimous that 1383 is is a horrible law, and the state can't even tell you what the, what it means, and uh, it, it's it's going to cost everybody tons and tons of money. There has already been lawsuits against the state, and every one of them was lost over 1383. But if you read the whole bill, there's provisions where they could come on your property to inspect your garbage cans, which is a violation of the Fifth Amendment in my estimation, maybe even the 14th Amendment. I have an attorney here that's shaking her head. Anyway, uh, the whole thing is just horrible. And I don't know how it got this far because trying to get down to 75% less organic waste than there was in 2014 with, yeah, with more people is, it's not attainable. It's right up there with the governor asking for two and a half million homes to be built by 2025. It can't be done. And yet, if it's not done, the state can fine us $10,000 a day for non-compliance. And I think it's, it's there to have us fail so that they can take over local control and take everything up to the state level and run everybody's lives. So that's my... So well, so for those of you that are negative, I have some positive. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna have to do an EIR on this deal, and the EIR is gonna say you can't do it. It's gonna cause too much air pollution for the savings, and we're I think we're gonna be fine. I say that tongue in cheek. Yeah. I'm just I'm just you know, but that's the that's to me right. You, you're gonna run a whole nother set of trucks all around the county to pick up a handful of waste. Uh, and, and so I, yeah, I, I mean, I agree with you all. It's, it's ludicrous. The um, and one thing that I shared with our uh, DPW uh, and uh, CEO is that it is is I want to know the cost, right? Because I believe that the cost to the every average or the citizens, right, is going to be more to do the pickup than it would be to do a separation at the site, right? And I think you kind of alluded to that a little bit. I think RWA should pay for it, but um, I guess uh, maybe somebody there thinks that the jurisdictions have paid for it. But I, I think ultimately that's where we end up. I, 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 you know, and I don't know. I don't have the math yet, but but I think we will. If you know, one hundred and forty dollars for extra for a business, right? It's two hundred and fifteen times twelve, twenty-five eighty. Well, but you're already paying seventy-five. No, that's to the city. This is to the garbage. Oh, 215 extra? To the garbage company. Uh, okay. If, if I may, um, the initial costs have already been given to the ad hoc committee team. So these individuals know, these jurisdictions know what those costs initially are. And so there's a period of negotiation that we're hopeful we can, we can negotiate to reduce those costs and see who's the best from that. And that's the next step. But I would just tell you, it's it's not a secret. It's there. The jurisdictions that are a part of that should know. City of Merced, County of Merced, Atwater, Livingston, you know, you'll know. And so whoever is in that ad hoc committee, uh, they know. And I'm, I can't discuss that, but it's okay. known. All right. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you, Eric. Thank you. So we'll move on to uh, Executive Director's report. Oh, as short as her presentation. Thank you. We'll move to. Uh, uh, go ahead, Stacey. I'm trying. <laughs> um, I do have a couple of things to mention, though. Um, I do want to just thank Chair Pereira and Director McDaniel for attending the CTC reception and NAV uh, Bagri and to uh, Dennis and our Caltrans partners for that excellent conversation that we're going to continue with um, related to our Highway 99 projects. Um, also want to thank um, many of you who participated in our One Voice program. So it was our first time back in D.C., as you know, for uh, over the last couple of years. Um, but I did just want to, to share a, a quick note. I got a text from Supervisor uh, Pedrozo, um, who's at the NACO conference in Alaska. 
and uh, he participated uh, in One Voice, and he was uh, one of our speakers for broadband. And so he sent me a text yesterday that said that Luke Gowan, I think it's Luke Gowan or Luke McGowan, but he's a gentleman in the White House um, Office of Intergovernmental Affairs that we met with while we're in DC. He's one of the speakers or was earlier this week at the NACO conference in Alaska. And when he was hearing um, from, you know, a number of supervisors about different issues and whatnot that were coming up, he, from his, from his speaking position, said, you know, I just met with Merced County Association of Governments uh, last week or whatever it was he said um, about these issues. And so we're aware that our you know, counties are experiencing them and whatnot. And he specifically mentioned Gustine and Gustine's projects. Um, so I, I just wanna highlight that because one, it's really cool that we're getting some name drops in, in uh, Alaska at this national conference, but I think it in, underscores the, the intangible benefits of, of One Voice. You know, a lot of times I think it's easy um, to want to measure our success by how much money we bring back. But this is also another version of what a successful trip looks like. It's when the name on the tip of the tongue of the White House Intergovernmental Affairs staffer while talking to other counties about these challenges is, oh, we just met with Merced County folks and they were talking about this and there's this community Gustine and this is what we're working, you know. So I, I think that's just, it's, it's a really awesome, um, I think, demonstration of, you know, at some point I'm going to see, we might have to get Tweenerville uh, t-shirts. Um, that's supervisor, director Silvera, you know, uses us as the Tweenerville. We're, you know, too small to be big and too big to be small. Um, but it, I just want to share that. It's, I think, a big success. Um, oh, and also just a reminder that the debrief for One Voice is uh, Friday the 27th at the Tarmac. So I think calendar invite has gone out. Um, so we'll hope to see you down all there. <laughs> um, that, uh, and then I, I do want to mention, uh, we got um, excellent news from our, our um, lobbying firm from Townsend right before this meeting that um, one of the other things we were in DC um, to promote uh, as part of our One Voice package was um, the needs yards, the needs yards has in terms of um, uh, needing uh, new vehicles, and we had submitted what you know was once known as an earmark, and I'm old school in that in that in that realm. But now, member designated projects, community funding request, an earmark. We had we had submitted one for yards for um, four new buses and uh, some other support. And I got word from um, Townsend just before the meeting that Costa, the Congressman Costa, has selected our earmark request as one of his sponsored projects through the appropriations process. Um, he also released. Um, what and this is for his entire district and they had a number uh, that they could um, su submit and I checked the list and in addition to the 3.86 million that's being uh, requested for yards for four buses, um, the city of Atwater's water, is it distribution enhancement? Uh, in the water enhancement project. So that's $3 million from the city of Atwater that was also included. And also the city of Gustine's broadband equity and expansion project of 1.35 million. So those, now this is the first step of the appropriations process, but it's a very big step. So um, more to come um, on that. And then uh, lastly, I just wanna mention, um, thank you, um, uh, Dennis, for mentioning the, the policy conference. I was bummed I couldn't be there uh, last week. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to share, and if Adam will pull up the slide, um, one of the efforts that we did as a region was to recognize leaders that we had lost um, in the last two years in our program. And so I was able to get uh, information in and we, we recognized um, Jerry O'Banion as a Valley leader uh, that we've lost in the last uh, two years. Just wanted to bring that to your attention. I thought it was a great tribute. And there, you can see, I know you may all recognize other folks. Uh, if you're interested in seeing this, um, we can also just you know scan this document if you wanna see the other Valley leaders. Um, I know Carol Whiteside worked with a number of us for many years. And many of you probably recognize some of your colleagues here. So just, just wanted to share that. Um, and with that, Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Nope. Okay, we'll do uh, move on to uh, 15 director's reports. I'll start on my left. Any reports? Your left is over here. We're in the army. Hey, is that like a no pass? Yeah, that's what I thought. I did that at the Board of Supervisors meeting, and everybody got a chuckle. So I'm going to do it again. No, I, this is a couple things. Uh, just really want to thank Stacy. I know Stacy's. Been a little under the weather and is kind of back in the saddle. So um, 
for you being here. That, that really means a lot. And, and I think it's kind of a testament that really, you know, as we kind of almost struggled to get a, a, a quorum for today's meeting, I just remember not too many, not too many months ago, these meetings, everybody was gearing up and ready to have a fight. And, and I think that things are heading in a good direction. And, and Stacy, I think that's under your leadership. And so uh, kudos to you. The one voice trip, again, I, I think, you know, Stacy said it jokingly, but knowing that you go in and you're meeting with, with folks, you know, whether it's the, it's the interior department or, or the department of energy or transportation or whatever it is that, you know, they're there to give you assistance, they, they're the guidance, they're, they're not really the ones that, that release the first strings on, on these things. I always take the approach of when we go into these meetings is, is give them a reason to remember us by. And, and, and when you go back there, you know, it seems like some of the staffers you talk to are younger and younger. And I realize kind of how the system works. And eventually, you know, those people are going to promote up and be the ones that are making the decisions. And so anytime that we can get an opportunity and, and make new friends and, and put Merced County on the map, um, I take full advantage of doing that anytime I can. And I think our whole group did. And really just a, a, the group that was there, you know, we broke up into strike teams. Our first day, we were, a lot of us were together and, and it's just, everybody kind of picks up. And, and after about halfway through the first day, you could pretty much give everybody spiel. I could give the spiel on Gustine, just like Gustine could give the spiel on Yard. So we all kind of work together and you refine the message. Uh, but overall, I think it, it was it was a really good trip. And, and um, you know, as you lead up to the meeting before and a few people dropped out and, and you're wondering, okay, how's this going to be? And then we get there and we just kind of, you know, everybody puts their nose to the ransom and, and, and really, I think it was a very successful trip and really proud of the fact that this organization said, no, we're going through with this. Because I can tell you, at least three of the meetings that I was in, we were their first meeting that they've had since the pandemic, back in person. So that's that's a, another reason that they, you know, they were like firing up the old computer and making sure it still worked, and 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 so those type of things. So really good opportunity on our part, timing wise, to be the first ones that they met with give gives them that, that another reason to remember us by but uh, thank you to all the staff that put that together and then they can't go without mentioning Townsend and, and Ben Goldine just knows he knows all the people over there he knows his way around the capital um, and really got us into what I think were some very valuable meetings so thank you for that yeah I too um, attended the one voice um, some of us um, <laughs> Some of us uh, did a little more. I, I caught COVID when I was there and brought it home and probably passed it on to some people. But I, I apologize. But uh, even working through that, every time we had a meeting, they were recognized as being the first ones face to face and were thankful and looking forward to working with us. And I've never worked with or been in these meetings where these folks were excited because they had money to spend and very encouraging for us to continue on. And um, even with uh, the radio project for the county that we were presenting, it was amazing how usually you get the pushback, but they were like, oh, encouraging, oh, and there's this program, and there's this program, and there's this program. I mean, it was just ongoing the whole time. And I agree with Scott, We uh, a lot of people did uh, drop off and weren't able to make the trip, but we were able to come together as one and we could we could present anybody's item at any time and there's a lot of meetings we are in where the opportunity came up where if the city of Gustine wasn't with me I was able to talk about their stuff right there on the spot and mention them and so we became so familiar with the one voice that somebody could mention this idea and you could pick right up for the next city or whoever else that you're working with but I appreciate staff, you did a great job. Uh, ben Goldeen has always been a, a great uh, contact in Congressman Costa's office, but I think he's even a better contact now uh, in Townsend's office. So that was a great move for all of us. And Ben did a great job. And, uh, Christopher Townsend was right there with us too. And he had his sleeves rolled up. I've never seen a guy take so many notes sometimes. He was learning some new stuff on the fly as well, so. It was excellent. Thank you. Now, those of you on my right, my turn. Uh -huh. Well, I heard you were out of pocket. And to me, out of pocket is when you have to pay for something yourself. And I hear you. you. You you said in your email, I think it was, that you're going to be out of pocket. And then today you mentioned it also. Um, oh, you know, oh, yeah. Yeah. Am, I, am I the only one who used that term? Out of pocket? 
when you're I always outside. think of it as you're having to pay for something. Yeah, it's like you're, you're outside of the communication zone. Like if I'm out of cell range, I'm out of pocket. That's an inappropriate use of it. I learned something. <laughs> out of pocket means I'm paying for it out of my pocket. You know, like if it was an impact yeah, bill, but I, that. you know. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I corrected her. I think we're good. Okay. Yeah, it's out of pocket. So it's out of pocket. Oh, you were using it wrong too? It's really like Okay. I think we got them figured out. Go ahead. Finish, please. Um, I would like to thank staff that was involved with, with the one voice also. I've heard from our participants that went what a fantastic event it was and how much they got out of it. And they've already been getting a lot of emails from staffers back there offering this and that. So I think it was a great job. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. But they, they commended all of you that put it together and got them here and there. And, you know, so it was, I think, I think this is probably one of the more productive ones probably in then in years past and a lot of us probably do to be in the first people so that all of you that went and all of you that helped thank you so much what you've done for our county yes. i did not attend the one voice so oh, oh yeah but you got money so you're happy <laughs> Um, I just want to say that Dos Palace is moving forward with our new city manager and actually getting um, quite a few sidewalk projects done. Uh, that Valeria Street needs to be worked on. I don't know what's going on with that. Um, and um, it's just nice to see that we're all moving forward and working together and um, coming up with a list of projects that we can accomplish, actually accomplish. So um, Dots Palace is moving in the right direction. And um, I did last weekend have a walkathon for um, some scholarships for Dots Palace high school students. And we raised two to three thousand dollars. So I was pretty happy with that. We were trying to get to five, but it didn't happen. And if you've never been to Dots Palace, we are on the fly kind of people. And we just kind of planned it like a week ahead of time. And said, come on out. So um, I made t-shirts and we, we had water and it was a nice time. However, Mr. Uh, Supervisor Silvera, um, we had it around the beautiful, uh, nice street around the county park. Um, but the county park itself, I was quite embarrassed because I had a lot of people coming from out of town to do this walk. And it was very dry, uh, lots of trash. Uh, and so let's get together and try and figure out what to do about that poor park. Um, it's, it's, it's on my radar. And um, you can rest assured, ask my colleagues. I've shared with them my foot. It, it was very, uh, I, I think next year we're going to have it at the, the new um, all-weather track um, and not do it around the park. But uh, I just... <laughs> I just wanted to thank everybody who participated in my little walkathon. This is the third annual walkathon, and um, uh, it, it, it goes to a good cause. So, anyway, um, that was that. I'm just very excited that Dos Palace is it, it, it's got some projects done. I just can't believe it. So, anyway, thank you. I was on Facebook. I heard they have a great mayor, and that's why it's all happening. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Director Lewis, did you have uh, any uh, board report? Well, um, I don't have a, a particular report in regards to MCAG. Um, I'm happy to be here today. It's been a few years since I've been to one of the meetings to sit in for the mayor. Um, I would like to say I, I, I did miss the meeting today, uh, Chairman Pereira, with the uh, Air Quality Board. Uh, did you have a good lunch? You know, I did. Well, so I didn't have lunch. Um, uh, uh, Shane Parsons was having a scholarship luncheon at his facility. So that's in series. So I stopped there on the way. So I guess I did have a great lunch, okay. but it wasn't well, on the air district. Uh, out of I, I, miss, I missed the board meeting today because we had our groundbreaking ceremony for our new police department. And uh, I'm really excited and looking forward to seeing that uh, building go up. Uh, it's, it's been a long time coming and um, well needed in our community. Um, I, 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 don't I didn't have any information from the mayor uh, to pass on as a report to the committee. So I just thank you for allowing me 
to attend today. Um, and on a side note, in regards to the Air Board, uh, Chairman Prayer, I, I do need to email you in regards to a, a bill that's coming down uh, through the state of California that I need to talk to you about. So look, look for an email from me on that. But other than that, uh, it's all it's good to see all of your faces uh, today and uh, glad to be here. Thanks we a lot. The mayor, but we were happy to, to have, you, have you here in the meeting. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, well, I my, mine will be quick and short. Um, so the follow up meeting for uh, one voice is May 27th. Um, have we made sure that uh, Blake will have all the scooters locked up? Sorry, I just, I just, I couldn't let that one go. And with that, we'll call our meeting adjourned. <laughs>